So we've reached basically the last two lectures in our first unit here, Metaphysics and Epistemology, where we've looked at various views describing what the nature of reality is like and how we can know it. Well, one of the views that has been entertained recently is the view that perhaps reality is not what we think it is. Perhaps we're actually living in something like a giant computer simulation. If you've seen The Matrix, you've heard of this idea before. You've probably talked about it with your friends. Well, today we're looking at an article that tries to argue that this is likely the case. And as we'll see, the thinker that we're looking at today doesn't just provide a qualitative argument for this, that is an argument just using words, but a quantitative argument. He actually formulates this mathematical equation to try to provide support for this idea that, well, one of three claims is true, but most likely we're probably living in a simulation. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We entertained this idea when we looked at the philosophy of Descartes, when at the beginning of his meditations, he was engaging in this radical doubt with respect to what he believes and what he thinks he knows. And what we talked about in that class was, well, how do we know we're not having a collective hallucination right now? Can we know that with certainty? How can we know that we're actually awake and we're sitting here in the classroom together talking about this stuff? How can we know we're not living in the matrix? Today we're going to do a deep dive into that possibility. And to do that, we're looking at a paper written by this guy, Nick Bostrom. I believe he is a philosopher at Oxford. Uh, he's Swedish, and he's what you might call a futurist, somebody who has done a lot of thinking into, well, what the future of human society is going to be like, what some of the trends are, uh, what they look like, and what role technology does and should have in our lives. He's written on a lot of different topics related to this, such as the simulation theory, which we're going to look at today, Existential risk, which discusses what are some of the <laughs> threats facing down humanity, AI perhaps being one of them that a lot of people are talking about today. Human enhancement through modifying our bodies with machine technology and artificial intelligence more generally. So this is somebody who has a very mathematical mind, a very technological way of looking at things. And I always think this is an interesting thing to discuss with students. It's what you all voted for. So that's what we're going to look at today. Does anybody have any questions so far? OK, well, let's jump into what he has to say about this possibility that we might be living in a computer simulation. If he didn't make it explicit in the article, I'm going to make explicit for you today some of the assumptions, perhaps, that you might need to take on board if you're going to believe that this idea is true, that we're actually living in a computer simulation. These assumptions have a direct connection to the themes that we've been looking at in this class up until this point metaphysical claims about the nature of reality, claims about the nature of the human mind. What does it take or what is required for consciousness to exist? What could that potentially look like? So perhaps the first assumptions of the argument that he's putting forth here are that naturalism and materialism are true. Can anybody remember what these terms were, what these views were? Naturalism and materialism? Yes, yeah? Uh, naturalism is the view that nature is all that exists and 
the supernatural do not exist. Right, exactly. So naturalism is the view that everything that exists is either a product of nature or a part of nature. So in some fundamental sense, this table is natural insofar as it's made up of the same stuff as everything else. Right? Human beings are natural. The contemporary scientific view says we've evolved over, well, human beings specifically, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we're products of a common biological ancestor. But that all the stuff in reality is natural and no supernatural things exist. There are no gods, demons, angels, spirits, ghosts, whatever. And this is a pretty commonsensical view. It's a pretty widely held view. Bless you. Going along with this is the assumption of materialism. Does anybody remember what materialism says? Similar to naturalism, but a little different. Right. It's closely tied to what we might call physicalism. We didn't discuss this in depth, but physicalism is the view that everything that exists is physical. Materialism is a view closely associated with that. It's the view that, yeah, everything is just made of matter. This thing is made of matter. The chair is made of matter. My watch, your brain, your mind, it's all made of matter. And what contemporary physicists think that is, is, well, we could talk about particles on one scale, atoms and molecules, stuff like that. Or we could talk about waves, excitations of various electromagnetic fields and other kinds of fields. So these are two assumptions that this argument is going to be based on, that everything is natural or a product of nature, that everything is just made of matter. There's no supernatural stuff. There's no wooey eternal soul or something like that. Closely associated with these views is what we might call the idea of substrate independence. Substrate independence is basically the view that consciousness can exist and, or a mind could exist and does not require biological stuff. That is, we could produce or simulate a human mind or consciousness without organic matter. If you've read any sci-fi, if you've consumed any media like that, this is often an idea that comes up, right? If we have a complex enough computer with an arrangement of wires and a certain stream of electrons and parts, that we could simulate a consciousness or a human mind. Or perhaps that we could upload our minds into the cloud or onto some giant supercomputer, right? This is another view that Bostrom's argument is going to be based on. Minds do not need to be organic. We could produce them, we could create them, we could house them in inorganic things, like computers or maybe like a silicon-based uh, system, something like that. So do these views make sense? You following along so far? We have three main assumptions, naturalism, materialism, and consciousness does not require an organic substrate to exist. It does, it's not confined merely to the human being or forms of intelligent life. We could create or simulate it in a computer. And if you've grown up in the contemporary West, which pretty much all of you have, these do not seem like crazy assumptions, right? There's something that has have been explored a lot in our sci-fi, in our media, in the shows that we consume, like Black Mirror and stuff like that. These are not crazy things to believe in. There are a lot of people who believe in these views. So if you accept them, or if you think they're at least plausible, Bostrom's got enough stuff here for his argument to get off the ground. There are a few other presumptions that also go along with this.
Bostrom's argument kind of hangs on a particular analysis of what the future of humanity is going to be like. A lot of people who are in the technology sphere, in the futurism sphere, the transhumanism sphere of thought, think that, well, if we observe certain trends in the development of technology throughout the last few hundreds and even thousands of years, if you consider rudimentary forms of technology like stone tools and things like that, what we see is that technological advancement has increased exponentially since humans have been on the planet. Within the last hundred years, technology has taken many great leaps forward, right? With the invention of the transistor, with the inventions of other mechanical and computer parts that make up a lot of the world today. Well, what a lot of these thinkers believe is if this trend continues and we continue continue inventing and advancing at this exponential rate that we are on, odds are incredibly high that in our near future, human life is going to be radically changed due to the emergence of these new forms of technology that are going to completely change how we look at ourselves, others, what is possible, and how society should work and the place technology should have in our lives. If you go far enough down this rabbit hole, you'll see that there are thinkers that believe that we will develop such advanced forms of technology that not only will we change our bodies and our minds and our societies will be radically changed, but we will become something that won't even really be regarded as human anymore. We will have transcended our biological limits achieved perhaps immortality, the ability to house our identities and things that aren't going to die and waste away like computers. Bostrom and other thinkers call these people or beings post-humans. What humans are basically going to transform into if our rate of technological advancement keeps up and we use that technology to change ourselves and society. From the point of view of humans now, we can't even conceive of what post-humans are going to be like because they're going to be so different. They're not going to look like us. They're not going to think like us. But due to taking technology and applying it to themselves and the world, everything is going to be different. It's going to be a lot different than we think of things now. So in our near future, it's likely that some of these thinkers think Humans are going to become post-human. They're going to become something bigger, better, smarter than what we have going on now. If that is the case, if we develop these amazing forms of technology that can transform ourselves and the world around us, it's not a leap to think that post-humans may run a lot of simulations. Simulations of their own history, of our own evolutionary history, simulations about you know, how to solve these complex physical and mathematical problems, all these different things. So another idea that Bostrom's argument is going to depend on is this idea that, well, our technology will get so good that not only will we likely transform ourselves in very fundamental ways, but in the future we'll probably run a lot of simulations because we have the ability to do that and because it will help us solve problems and because humans are naturally curious, right? They like to monkey around with stuff. <laughs> if you accept that, if you accept that the odds are likely that humans are going to transform themselves, the world around them, and run a lot of simulations in the future, then a certain idea or fact confronts you. If it's true that post-humans are going to run a lot, a lot, a lot of simulations, then if it's true that consciousnesses can be simulated, like the consciousnesses that you have, the odds are really high 
that, well, from the point of view of where we're standing, it doesn't seem like we can know without much certainty that we're not a simulated consciousness. That if we're going to run a lot of simulations in the future, the vast majority of minds to ever exist in human history will be simulated. This is something to really chew on. This is an interesting idea. So our biased point of view wants to assume that human consciousness hasn't been around for a long time. The only consciousnesses to have ever existed are in humans, since humans, you know, first sprung up. But that's a little bit unfounded if you accept some of the assumptions here. Trying to ascertain what our place in the world is and what exactly we are like, whether or not our reality is a simulation, you might reasonably believe that the odds are high your consciousness is simulated. We've already perhaps reached a post-human stage. This whole thing is just a simulation. We're just one of the unlucky ones that's in it. Okay, does all of this make sense? You still following along? Okay. So, to advance his argument, Bostrom basically thinks about what a potential future for humanity is going to look like. Again, if these technological trends continue, if we continue advancing at the rate that we are, if our computers keep getting better and better and better, what is the future going to look like for us? Well, I've already impressed upon the point numerous times that our society is going to change drastically. How we see ourselves is going to change drastically. What we use computers for is going to change. According to these thinkers, in the near future, we might reach a point that is known as the singularity. Has anybody heard of this, the singularity? Ray Kurzweil, for example, I believe, thinks it's going to happen in the 2050s. The singularity is this hypothetical scenario in which we will have reached such a point at technological advancement that we'll have computers running all these simulations, we'll be able to change what our bodies are like, transform the world around us, but the rate of technological advancement will be so, so, so high, so fast, that we'll be making Nobel Prize winning discoveries every second. And from that point, this singularity point, everything that we know is going to be irrevocably transformed. And from our, where we're standing, unconceivable, because it'll be so different. One of the things that we might be interested in doing, supposing we do develop such technology that we can run these giant simulations, is, well, set the initial conditions of a bunch of simulations of what the universe was like at the beginning and see how it evolved. See you know, what our evolutionary ancestors were like, see how the Earth changed, simulate events in human history that are important that we want to learn more about. Really, the applications for this are astronomical, right? If we could know exactly what the past was like, if our universe follows certain natural and physical laws, it would seem like we would be able to know what happened in our past and what's going to happen in the future. So we might have a lot of good reason to try to simulate a bunch of different things. Not only to increase our own knowledge, but for fun. Perhaps in the future, simulations will become something of an entertainment product. I know a lot of you have probably seen Rick and Morty, right? You'll be able to go into the machine and live a life, meet Jesus if you want, a simulated version of Jesus. Kind of do whatever you want to do. That is a possibility, right? 
Now, from our point of view, this seems crazy because the technology that we have right now is very limited. Perhaps you struggle with the capabilities of your own computers, right? If I open too many tabs on my Chromebook, it crashes. <laughs> but we are developing more advanced computers every day, more advanced parts. We've been able to make these things relatively small, right? Think about the phone that you just have in your pocket. It's very small, and it's more advanced than the computer that was used when we flew to the moon. But running such simulations would probably require a lot of energy. A lot, a lot of energy. Energy that we don't have the means to access right now due to our hardware limitations. But it is not inconceivable that in the future we will develop the technologies and the abilities to harness the energy of our stars, of our sun, of celestial bodies in other galaxies. You could quite easily imagine that if our technology continues to advance at the rate that it does, we will be able to build computers that are the sizes of cities, the sizes of planets. Such simulations might require such advanced, large computers. But this will not be outside the realm of possibility due to the fact that we will probably have created machines that can replicate themselves and build everything for us and rewrite their own code and fix all of our social and economic problems. So the kind of picture that he paints for us is very technologically futuristic. Based on the current trends, our technology has been advancing rapidly over the last few thousand years very rapidly and if we have any interest in using that technology to transform the world and ourselves we're probably going to do it now if you're thinking hard about this you probably have a lot of questions what would be required to run these simulations what are they going to be like? Do they need to simulate everything? Well, the answer to that last one is probably no. Think about a video game, for example. If you know anything about video games, you know that in most video games, the entire map that you can explore is not completely rendered whenever you load into a particular area. There are a lot of things that aren't rendered, that aren't simulated in the video game. Like the insides of objects, right? Because normally you're just looking at it from the outside. And so if you can manage to clip the camera on the inside, you just see empty space, right? But the video game provides enough Im immersion for you that it doesn't break your experience. You're not looking inside everything all the time. You're not clipping out of bounds all the time. But you're immersed in the game. Maybe part of you thinks it's a little bit real. The same kind of general principle applies to simulations that post-humans might run in the future. They won't need to simulate everything in the universe. The simulations will only need to simulate, well, what human beings can see, right? Maybe they won't even need to simulate what the inside of your body looks like until in the simulation somebody cuts it open and then it renders, right? Or what the inside of an object looks like. We won't have to simulate that. It'll look real to us. But then once we cut it, we'll sim it'll simulate the inside. So get rid of this idea, if you have it, that for the simulations to be real and to seem really convincing, they'll have to simulate everything. They won't. They will not have to do that. If we run simulations at all, Bostrom thinks the odds are high that we're going to run a lot of them. Why? Well, we'll have the capability to do so, 
humans, for some reason, have this drive to really do stuff before they think about it, right? To experiment a lot, to try to figure out as much about the universe as they can through all these various means. So I don't think it's a logical leap to believe that if we do run simulations, we're probably not going to just stop at one. We're probably going to do a lot of them for various reasons. Scientific research, evolutionary research, research into our own history, simulations about what our future might be like, what technology might be coming down the pipe, things that we may want to invent. Consequently, if we run, if the odds are high that we're going to run a lot of simulations, that implies something very strange about consciousness. It implies that in the future, perhaps the far future, the vast majority of minds or consciousnesses that will have ever existed will be simulated ones. And this is something, this is an idea that Bostrom's argument kind of hinges upon. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this. If it's true that we'll run a lot of simulations, it would seem like the odds are very low that we are one of the ones that is not in a simulation. Okay. Any questions? You still following along? Okay, let's now turn to Bostrom's argument for this. He provides an argument and a mathematical equation to try to support the idea that odds are, perhaps 33% chance, we'll see, that we're living in a simulation. He says that one of these claims is very likely true. There are three possibilities in regards to the future of humanity. One, the human species will very likely go extinct before reaching a post-human stage. On our bad days, this seems fairly likely, right? Countries have nuclear bombs. Perhaps you're worried about societal collapse. Perhaps you're worried about bio-warfare, uh, the rise of artificial intelligence, environmental degradation. It does not seem beyond the pale to think we're probably going to kill ourselves before we can become enlightened and fix everything and work together. So that's one possibility. We kill ourselves before we develop the technology to do this. Or perhaps we do develop the technology to do this, but for some reason we don't run these kinds of simulations. We'll get into what those reasons might be in a little bit, but this is also not something that's crazy to think. Perhaps there might be laws against it. Perhaps our moral code advises against it. Perhaps we will have learned all that we need to and we have no scientific or epistemic need to run such s simulations. Or if those two aren't true, this last one is probably true. We, all, we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation ourselves. Why? Well, we've already seen some of the reasons that he's given. If we reach a post-human stage and we run simulations, we'll probably run a lot of them because we'll have the ability and the drive to do so. Because we will probably run a lot of simulations if that is the case the vast majority of human consciousnesses that will ever exist will be simulated ones and so if we are betting people if we're betting on the odds and we think we will reach a post-human stage and run simulations we should think that we're one of the simulated minds because mathematically speaking it will be I don't know, 0.00001% that we're actually living in the real world? Something like that. 
This kind of puts his argument into words. Let's look at the mathematical equation that he develops in order to support the, this idea that one of these is true. The basic idea of the paper can be expressed roughly as follows. If there were a substantial chance that our civilization will get to the post-human stage and run many ancestor simulations, then how come we are not living in such a simulation? I shall develop this idea into a rigorous argument. I need to introduce the following notation. And he's going to give us some variables here with definitions. Call FP the fraction of all human level technological civilizations that survive to reach a post-human stage. I know this is not the best resolution, but you can see it here, FP. Call N the average number of ancestor simulations run by a post-human civilization. Here and here in the formula. And call H the average numbers, number of individuals that have lived in a civilization before getting to a post-human stage. If we define our terms in this way, we can calculate the odds that we are living in a simulation right now, which is FP times N times H over that plus h. And you can look at this equation yourself and scrutinize it, but its general form is something that I've seen a lot pop up in mathematics. So I don't think he's doing something crazy here. Now what he goes on to do for us is simplify this equation in a very helpful way that will help us see how his argument works. And then he plugs in a few different numbers. He takes the limit of the simplified equation, and if we take the limit and we take each variable to a different limit, to its own limit, we'll see that this equation basically pumps out three possible answers. I'll let you all finish writing here, and then I'll move on to the next slide. This next part is going to require a little bit of math, but I think we're awake enough to do it. It's not too hard. If I remember my limits correctly, we can get through this together. OK. Writing. F1 for the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running ancestor simulations or that contain at least some individuals who are interested in them and have sufficient resources to run a significant number of them. And N1 for the average number of ancestor simulations run by such interested civilizations. We have N equals F1N1. Because of the immense computing power of post-human civilizations, and one is extremely large, as I pointed out in the previous section, while f shows that one, uh, at least one of the following three propositions must be true. So here's the simplified equation. The odds that we are living in a simulation is as follows. fp times this term times n1 over fp times this term times n1 plus 1, or i, rather. So let's take the limit of this equation, right? Does anybody remember what the terms were before? Go back to your notes. What was fp? OK, so let's assume that we don't survive to reach a post-human stage, right? Let's take the limit of FP approaches 0. What do we get? Well, we plug in 0 here. We plug in 0 here. 0 times something times something is 0. 
that's 0 plus 1. 0 over 1 is what? 0, right? So look, there we go. We might die before we reach a post-human stage. Thus, the odds of us living in a simulation are 0. Because we don't reach the stage to develop simulations. There might be a lot of ways that this could happen. Some thinkers hypothesize that when it comes to the advancement of civilizations, there might be something that prevents us from ever reaching a post-human stage that's called the Great Filter. A great filter is just a way of describing there is some sort of barrier to our continued evolution and advancement. Something that organisms can't seem to get past for whatever reason. We might blow ourselves up with nuclear bombs, right? This might be a distinct possibility. Not every country likes each other. Right? And all these countries are allied with each other on different teams. So if somebody shoots a nuke off, a lot of other nations are going to shoot nukes off, right? That's a worry. So we might all die in some sort of nuclear holocaust. That's a possibility. One of the things that people worry about is the research that we're doing into viruses and bacteria. Maybe we're accidentally doing some classified research somewhere and a bug gets out that ends up wiping everybody out. That might be a possibility. Maybe everybody will die because we degrade the environment so badly and it can no longer support life. And we can't escape to another star system before that happens and find a habitable planet. There are a lot of different ways that we might all die, right? So that's a possibility. Let's look at another one. Let's look at this term, F1. If that is supposed to represent for us how many simulations that we're going to run once we reach a post-human stage. Well, you could imagine for various reasons that we might not run any. And if that's the case, we take the limit of this to 0, right? 0, 0, that gives us 0 again. So if we don't run any, run any simulations, the odds that we're in one is about 0, right? Duh. What might be the reasons for this? Can you imagine why we might not run these simulations in the future, even if we have this technology? What do you think? Why might we not run any? How, why or how would it be unethical? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> It's unethical to bring billions of consciousnesses into existence and like expose them to pain and suffering and simulations. Maybe that's not cool. Maybe there will be a law against that or morally we don't believe in that. And we're like, that's barbaric, bringing these things into an, into a, an existence that is fake and they experience pain and suffering. We can't do that. That's bad. Why else might we not do this? Maybe perhaps we just find out that simulations are not worth it. Maybe they take a lot of energy, a lot of power. Maybe our resources are best used elsewhere. Maybe we don't need to because by the time we will have developed this technology, we will have known as much about the universe that we need to. So we, we won't have an epistemic interest in running these. Maybe we won't have the resources to build these giant computers. You could think of a whole range of possibilities, right? OK, so if we don't run any, then the odds are likely that, well, we're not in a simulation because we're not going to run any. But then what's the last possibility? If it's true that 
we're going to run a lot, a lot, a lot of simulations, well, it becomes apparent that odds are likely that we're living in one right now. What was this term again? N? Yes? There you go. Let's take the limit of that to infinity. <laughs> right? What do we have? Infinity over infinity plus 1, which approximates to odds of chance of 1 that we're living in a simulation, 100%. Yeah. If we run a lot, a lot of simulations, odds are, mathematically speaking, our consciousness right now is one that is simulated. Humanity has already reached a post-human stage, and this is all just a simulation. We're not living in the real world. And there are a lot of different ways that this could be, right? Maybe the simulation that we're living in is just a child's game, like a very complex version of The Sims. Wouldn't that be crazy to think about, right? They say God has a sense of humor. What if God, you know, is just a kid playing with his toy? Or maybe we're going to develop simulations that then develop simulations, and there are multiple levels of these, right? And we're like seven simulations down. A simulation within a simulation within a sim That's possible, right? It could be that we're all in a simulation, it could be that maybe just all of us are the only simulated consciousnesses and everything out there are just NPCs. That's a possibility. You probably think that way already, right? When you are out in the world, you're like, these people don't think. Like, what? <laughs> We could imagine a billion different ways of how this could go. They're, they could be population-wide ones very small ones, simulations that only run for a very short amount of time, simulations that run for a very long time, simulations within simulations, etc. So is this scary to think about? What do you all think of his argument? You like the mathematics that he developed? Are you convinced? One of three is true. We're either going to die, we're going to reach a post-human stage, but not run these things, or odds are we're in one right now. Yeah. It, it might not be exactly 33% chance. You know, like, we don't have all the information, right? Maybe the odds are much higher that we'll kill ourselves. You know? Maybe the odds are much higher that we'll just have no interest in running these things. Yeah. So what we can say, according to his argument, is that one of those three things is true, but maybe slapping an, an odds on it is not something that we can do right now. Yeah. Do any of y'all think that we're living in a simulation? There are a lot of people who think that we are. They're trying to break us out of it. If you look at contemporary research into physics, they're like, oh my goodness, there's all this evidence that our universe has like holographic properties. This is really weird, guys. What does this mean? Well, we're not really sure yet. <laughs> research is ongoing. What do you think? Do you think this is the real world? I'll wait. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think since those in a lot of those things like reactively are the ones that come up with some of the problems and not that everyone's like, 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 like,
Okay. So what, do, what does that lead you to believe or think? So maybe it's not outside the realm of possibility that we do develop such technology. Maybe crazier things have happened. I don't know. Yeah, we can do amazing thing with things with computers. Just imagine the amazing things we're going to be able to do once we develop a super intelligent AI or we develop computers the sizes of planets. It's kind of terrifying to think about. Let me ask you this. Can you know for certain right now that you're not in a simulation? What do you think? You're shaking your head, no? What do the rest of y'all think? I see a lot of shaking of heads. Does that scare you? Or are you just like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I still have to go to my job. Like, I still have to feed my dog. Like, that shit isn't going away. Yeah. You still feel pain and heartache and all that. Would life be less meaningful to you if you found out you were living in a simulation? No? Would somebody like to speak into that? Why not? I mean, you can already say it. Like, if you already found out you're in a simulation, you still have, like, new superpowers. It's not going to change anything. Like, if you do find out your simulation, the world technically is not going to change because there's still going to be people that are like, oh, we're not in a simulation. So it goes back and forth between them. Okay. So it wouldn't change how you look at your life? Oh, right, right, yeah, I mean, okay, so you're Neo and you find out you're in the Matrix, right? Unless you're the one, what are you going to do about it? Right? You're stuck in the Matrix. I don't know, maybe you work on trying to bust yourself out or your buddies out, but how the hell are you going to do that? And how could you even know for certain that you're in one to bust yourself out of it? Maybe it's not worth thinking about. I don't know. A lot of people have this intuition that if they found out they were living in a simulation right now, their life wouldn't have as much value or meaning. Does anybody have that intuition? Yeah, will somebody speak into that? Why, why do you feel that way? Would you think your reality is fake? And so it's like, this is just a fake thing. Like, it was never really real. Maybe your mind will go there. Although, I mean, this seems pretty real, right? Like, I can't, it's not transparent. I can't put my arm through it, right? You get sick. You got to take your cat to the vet like I did this weekend. Spend thousands of dollars to save his life. That's real. That sucked. You still taste things and eat things. So, would it be any less real? Yeah. For me, I don't really think it would change because, like, like you said, you can still feel like emotions and everything. So yeah. Like, I still have goals that I want to achieve. So, even if I found out. Okay. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people feel like that too. Although if you learned you were in a simulation and then you're like, I don't know, I have a goal of becoming a nurse. Is a goal, is that goal of becoming a nurse in a simulation like enough to fulfill you? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you here? 
there's been a lot of people who, well, they feel differently about this idea, why we are here. Is there an objective meaning or purpose to life? It doesn't seem like that's something that we can know with certainty right now. Some people think God created them for a reason. Some people think their existence is a cosmic accident. At least, perhaps, if we were living in a simulation, we were created for a reason. Right? I don't know. Does that help? Does that provide any meaning to you? There's a reason you're here. Maybe it's just a scientific experiment. But does that make you feel better? Y'all must be really sleepy. Nobody's interested in this? You don't want to talk about it if you're living in the Matrix? It's awesome, yeah. Okay, but if we all come to a realization that we live in a simulation, then, like, what? Like, we all break it, da 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 But, like, it's going to be the same type of, like, thing. Like, we're like, oh, we broke the simulation, okay, now our lives are what? Are we going to be working? Are we just going to have, like, a free will? Like, what? what's next? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, what what would be next? Would it be possible to break out of it if we did discover that we were in one? The fact that some people are trying to break us out of it leads me to believe that some people think, yeah, we can actually break out of it from the inside. But then how would that work? How would we get out? It's not like we have bodies. Well, maybe we have bodies. Maybe we're pod people, like in the Matrix, and our energy is being harvested by an AI or something. I don't know. Maybe, like, for me, like, thinking about it, like, if, I'm, if I found out I was in a simulation, I'd be like, why am I in a, in a simulation? Like, because if I'm in a simulation, then there's a reason for that. And it's probably better in here than it is outside of the simulation. So why would I want to be? Ah, that okay. So that's a that's an interesting point. If you found out you were in a simulation, would you want to stay in here, or would you want to try to get out? Would, I just want to know what you can do to get out. Like, is it the same thing we're doing now? Different? Like, if it's just another simulation, the level above us, you're like, well, then what's the fucking point, <laughs> right? Okay, if you knew that this is the this is, there's only one level. Would you rather live in a simulation or would you rather live out there which you don't know what it's like, you don't know what's going on? The matrix is to be believed. Humans have this innate desire or drive to participate in real reality, right? And that that's good. But would you want to do that? Is your life good enough right now that you're like, nah, I'm sticking in the simulation, man. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, why? Well, it's not too bad, I guess. And I really wouldn't take the chance to see what's out there in case it sucks. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's really, really bad. Maybe, just maybe, uh, there is like no world really out there to go back to that's sustainable for us. And the simulation was created to keep humans existing because the environment out there is not hospitable to human life. And we all escaped into a simulation. And then trying to get out would be really bad, right? Because there's nothing out there. But we can't know that, right? Yeah? Too scary? Yeah. But don't you want to know? Don't you want to know what's really going on? <laughs> you want somebody to go out and, and all right, you go out and you report back. Tell us what's going on out there. We'll send out, you know, some reconnaissance. Yeah, yeah, I mean, once you start going down this rabbit hole, if you take on the kind of radical doubt that Descartes started with in his meditations, this stuff can be pretty scary to think about, right? I think a lot of people have this intuition that they want to be a part of real reality. But there are a lot of incentives that 
might cause you to behave otherwise, right? I think maybe your life is not too bad. I don't know. Of course, all of his arguments depend on these assumptions that we looked at at the beginning of class, right? Particularly that materialism is true and that we could simulate consciousness and we could create human minds and house them in inorganic material. If you don't believe this stuff, you don't really have to worry about the simulation thing, right? Because you probably don't think it's possible. Do you all just accept the assumptions or are you still questioning that? Do you think that a computer could house like a consciousness that could think and feel and have emotions and desires? I'm a little skeptical. I don't know. The only thing that we currently have evidence of that can have consciousness is a biological life form. It's not saying it's impossible, but... That's a great question. You ever drop something and you can't find it for days and days? And then it shows up where you've already looked. Maybe that's a glitch in the simulation. Maybe there are glitches. Maybe there are bugs. Have you ever had a crazy experience where you thought you were going to die and then, I don't know, magically nothing bad happened? Strange things happen, right? You can talk to your uncle or any of your family members or friends about all the crazy things that have happened to them that don't make sense, right? So I don't, can we say that there aren't glitches or bugs? I don't know. That, that's hard. Some people think that the structure of our universe suggests that we're in a simulation, due to the holographic idea that I mentioned earlier, but also there seem to be strict rules on how things work, what you might think is analogous to a certain programming code. We can't go faster than the speed of light. What's up with that? Maybe that's like a hardware limitation <laughs> on, on our reality or something. Yeah. Strange. In any case, if you don't buy into these, you're probably not too worried about his argument, right? Because you think, well, maybe we can't simulate a consciousness in a computer. Maybe all that exists isn't just matter. Maybe there's other stuff. Maybe you think the immaterial soul exists and that you can't house that in a computer or upload that to the cloud. It, so there, it could be. It could be. Kinda, you know, it's um. You could think of this view, this simulation theory, as there are controllers who are watching, or you could just think of it as they're running the simulation and they're watching, but they're not intervening on anything. They're just seeing what plays out. Yeah, it could be either, right? Maybe all of the experiences that people have that are religious and miraculous are just the controllers of the simulation intervening and doing some cool shit. I don't know. Right? Yeah, isn't that a possibility? There are multiple ways to think about this. If you buy into some of the fundamental assumptions of transhumanism, futurism, materialism, this does not seem far-fetched. But you might be asking yourself also, even if I accept that we may run a lot of simulations in the future, 
What reason do I have for believing that we've made it to that point? You know, maybe we're in 2024 and we're not going to develop that stuff until 2600. Why couldn't you think that? You know, why assume you're one of the simulated consciousnesses? That's something that you could think about. Closely related to this topic or idea is artificial intelligence. Is this something that y'all are worried about or have thought about at all? There are two sides to this debate that's going on right now. AI is going to save everything or AI is going to fuck everything up. And we'll all die. Are you on one side of this debate or have you thought about this at all? I'm terrified of it. Like I know they just ran a program with the military where it took over the drone and like they told like we have like leadership that tells them what to do and they told it not to bomb certain people and like, ran through the program and it did it anyway, so it took over by itself. Okay. Like, Read an article and it's pretty interesting, but yeah. So you're worried about what this stuff might do. Yeah. It's been a really difficult programming problem to decide and then have these artificial intelligence algorithms follow some sort of ethical code, right? Which one do we decide to program it with? Is it actually going to follow it? There are all these sci-fi stories, right, of AI that goes awry, that thinks it knows better than humans, that realizes humans are the plague on this planet. All the humans need to die. Right? Yeah, so maybe this is something you're worried about. I'm a little worried about it. I think there are a lot of companies that are just doing their AI research willy-nilly, don't really understand what's going on. Our knowledge of this is limited. Yeah, it can be really scary. Do y'all want to hear something even scarier? Once I tell you about this, you're kind of trapped, in a sense, okay? So if you're somebody who scares easily, if you're worried about your eternal future, you should leave the classroom now. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that, okay? Because you all have plausible deniability right now. I'm being serious. I'm not joking. This kept me up for a night thinking about this. I really wrestled with this. Nobody's going to leave. You know what curiosity did to the cat, right? Okay, all right, we'll talk about it. Have you all ever heard of Pascal's Wager? Pascal was a French philosopher who basically tried to provide an argument that if you're a rational person, you should believe and act as if God exists. Why? It's the rational thing to do. Think about it. If God does exist, and you don't believe and act according to what God wants, you'll suffer eternal suffering. Net infinite negative. If God does exist, and you do what he wants, and you believe in him, you will not suffer, you will have eternal bliss, infinite net positive. If God doesn't exist and you don't believe in him, finite positive, you get the kind of pleasures you get on earth. If God doesn't exist and you do believe in him, net positive also, because you're being a good person, people like you, your social status is good, your reputation is good. So, net negative, infinite negative, Net infinite positive, net finite positive, net finite positive. He tried to use this argument to show that you should believe and act as though God exists because that's the thing, rational thing to do given the calculus. Well, a number of years ago, on one of these futuristic technology boards, people started talking about this stuff. This AI stuff, this simulation stuff. 
These people are very scientifically minded. They bought into a lot of the assumptions that we talk about here. Naturalism is true, true. materialism is true. You don't need an, an organic life form to have consciousness. You could house it in a computer or simulate it or create it out of inorganic things. Because a lot of them believe this, one of the users on this board, this form, Rocco, came up with a terrifying thought experiment. Now that I tell you this, you're going to be faced with a dilemma. You're not going to have plausible deniability, okay? So I'll give you one more opportunity to leave. All right. Rocco put forth the following thought experiment. AI is going to very likely be developed at some point. An AI that can rewrite its own code, that is infinitely superior and more intelligent than human <clears throat> beings, that will be able to achieve a mastery over nature that we cannot even conceive of because it's so smart and has so much power. If you think that this is likely, you have a terrifying choice in front of you. Because what do you think an AI that is basically all-powerful is going to do to somebody that actively chose not to bring it into existence? Is it outside the realm of possibility to think that it might be a little bit vindictive and angry that you did not help bring it into existence? If it's not, there's a possibility that in the future when this AI is developed, because of the laws of the universe, because it's going to know basically everything, it will know exactly what the configuration of atoms is like in your body to give rise to your consciousness. It will bring you back to life and it will make you suffer for all eternity in a simulated hell. So, if you do nothing, that might happen to you. So, put all your money into AI research, go buy lottery tickets and hope you win, or else you might be fucked. Is this scary? <laughs> no, it's just a swallow. It's a little scary if you believe in these assumptions. This thought experiment is known as Rocco's Basilisk. Why? Well, what is a basilisk? It's something that, if you look at it, it turns you to stone, right? Now that you see the problem, you see the choice in front of you, what are you going to do? Are you going to try to bring this into existence or not? You're just going to hope it doesn't come into existence and it doesn't resurrect you and torture you for all eternity or not? You can't claim you didn't know. Because now you all know, thanks to me. Now you all know. And it will know that. It will know that you knew. Because there will be a record of this lecture on the internet. And it will have already listened to it. That's the choice that's in front of you now. It's like Pascal's wager gone insanely wrong. So don't say I didn't warn you. I warned you. You all stayed here. And now you're in the same predicament that I am. Now if you're a good person, you won't tell your friends about this unless you give them the warning first. Okay? All right. Any questions, concerns, comments? Should have left the room. Should have left the room, yeah. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Maybe you should have. <laughs>